So our next uh, our next talk will be held by Michael Finn from uh, the Danish uh, or the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. Um, our guest, and he will present to us on the northeast Greenland continental margin. Um, yeah, so Michael has a broad geoscientific interest, but particularly so in the geology of East Greenland uh, and the Danish North Sea. So with that, I'll uh, I'll just hand straight over, I think. So Michael, if you're able to share your screen, uh, please go ahead and look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to my kitchen. Um, can you see my, my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, that's great. Um, so yesterday, my colleague Martin Sönerholm, he presented on uh, the, uh, the resource assessment uh, undertaken by uh, GEOS, that would be the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland, together with Nuna Oil and the Greenland authorities, uh, on the, the resource assessments of the entire uh, Greenland margin. Uh, today, I would like to, to uh, take a, a, a step further and look into some of the geology that was put into this uh, resource assessment uh, with uh, emphasis on the northeast Greenland margin. And the northeast Greenland margin has uh, for many years been uh, considered as a uh, highly promising margin uh, with a, a extremely high petroleum potential. And the reason uh, for, for these expectations uh, is, is uh, rooted in, in uh, the presence of, of uh, source rocks in uh, onshore northeast Greenland, where you see uh, several uh, source rock intervals, very rich source rock interval. Uh, the richest probably being the Upper Jurassic to Ryazanian uh, Kimmeritz clay equivalent source rock, uh, which is up to 600 meters thick uh, with an average uh, HI value of uh, more than 300. Uh, and, and a TOC of probably averaging around 5%. So a, really a, a world-class source rock. And as you can see on the, the map to the, uh, the right here, uh, these, uh, this source rock uh, is, is really present across a large area. It's marked with this, this dark brown color in the lower part of the map and with the gray colors in the offshore area here. So a source rock that is really covering a, a very large region. Also in uh, in northeast Greenland onshore, there is a lot of uh, potential reservoir intervals, and and the most famous is probably uh, the Jurassic uh, sandstone reservoirs, which is uh, this uh, lower picture is a picture of of middle Jurassic Pelion formation, uh, which is also uh, really present across a large region, uh, outlined by these yellowish colors on these two maps here, both onshore, but it's also predicted to, to extend uh, regionally in the offshore area. So this was essentially the background for, for a very positive former resource assessment of, of the Arctic uh, region presented 30, 13 years ago by the USGS uh, that predicted uh, the Northeast Green and Martin to contain uh, roughly around 31 billion barrels of oil equivalent. And that essentially make made the uh, Northeast Greenland margin the third most prospective uh, margin in, in the Arctic. Most of these uh, 31 billion barrels of oil was predicted to uh, be being uh, contained within uh, Jurassic sandstone reservoirs trapped in, in large uh, faulted uh, structures uh, formed during latest Jurassic and early Cretaceous uh, rifting, uh, like these, these huge structures that you see on this seismic section here. Uh, in these light blue uh, colors here. Um, but we no longer believe uh, this, uh, this, let's say, source assessment to be entirely true anymore. And in this, I'd like to give you some geological background on, on why that is. <clears throat> so since this USGS uh, assessment 13 years ago, a lot of new data has been uh, collected uh, both onshore, northeast Greenland and north Greenland, but also in the offshore. Onshore, we have done a lot of, of uh, geological field work where we've investigated uh, the uh, sedimentary units and the uplift history and so on. Uh, and essentially, we can use that information as an analog to the offshore uh, basins located next to. Um, in the offshore area, uh, there's 
for the past 13 years or so been collected thousands of kilometers of modern uh, seismic data and there's also been uh, uh, collected stratigraphic uh, core wells which have uh, provided us insight into to the um, stratigraphy of uh, the offshore basins. Um, these stratigraphic core wells are uh, exploiting that that uh, the northeast Greenland margin was uplifted uh, and eroded during the later part of the Cenozoic. Result, uh, progressively older stratigraphy is subcropping the seabed towards the shore. Uh, and today we have a, a fairly good understanding of the mid Cretaceous and younger stratigraphy across the shelf here. Um, the deeper stratigraphy remains unsampled, but the uh, interpretation uh, of the deeper stratigraphy across structural highs, like here the Denmark Sound Ridge, uh, remains pretty much the same as it was in the, uh, the 90s. What has changed is the deeper stratigraphy in the basinal areas. Um, here uh, in, the, in the past, it was extremely difficult to, to uh, kind of tie the, the stratigraphic interpretations from highs and into the basin because you, uh, you need to cross some, some major faults and you're entering into basins that are, are heavily intruded by, by basaltic intrusions. So it's, it's a, a quite difficult jump to make. But today, because there's so much new seismic data, it's possible to tie around uh, these uh, these faults here, and you can enter into to the basin uh, in a much more reliable way than was than what was possible in in the past. And um, as you can see on the seismic transect, this seismic transect here is running along the length of the Denmark Sound basin. And if you look at the boundary between the light blue color and and the, the green color here, that's essentially the base Cretaceous on conformity which you can clearly trace from, from the Denmark Sound Ridge into this seismic section. And from the seismic section uh, up here in the north, you can trace it into the basin center, uh, very reliable. And as you can see, if you look at the scale, the depth of the base Cretaceous on conformity is extreme in the central part of the basin. And this is a result of an extremely thickly developed uh, lower Cretaceous uh, unit here. What you can also see uh, is put in uh, these uh, colored lines here, they are actually uh, denoting where the base Cretaceous on conformity has uh, previously been picked. Uh, and these uh, green and, and yellow uh, picks up here, that was based on, on uh, vintage, uh, vintage data, um, whereas this uh, these pink uh, pick here is uh, was based on, uh, well, let's say it was, was coming from a study that was, I guess it was was uh, centered around uh, license blocks. But this highlights also the necessity to, to uh, do more regional uh, interpretations of an area, even though that you, you're focusing in on, on license blocks, because shifting the base Cretaceous on conformity down to this extreme depth really has impacted the, the resource assessment of, of, of this region, as I will show you. And of course, when you, you produce or, or interpret such a, a, an enormous uh, Cretaceous succession that is, would be burying uh, Jurassic and older reservoir units, these reservoir units are, are likely to be, uh, the, the reservoir potential are likely to be highly degraded over large areas. The same, of course, goes uh, with, uh, with source rock, deeply situated source rocks like the Oxfordian to Ryazanian source rock, but also older source rocks, uh, which are likely to be over mature over much of the region. And this map here to the, to the right is a maturity map of the present day maturity of, of the, uh, the top of, of uh, the Oxfordian Ryazanian source rock interval. And as you can see, the yellow colors are outlining areas where, where that source rock is over mature. The red areas outline areas where it's it's gas mature. So this has really impacted uh, the resource assessment of the northeast Greenland margin, uh, and our new resource assessment has predicted that the northeast Greenland margin probably only contains around five and a half billion barrels of oil equivalent, and that's of course a significant decrease from the thirty-one billion barrels of oil. Uh, equivalents predicted uh, some 13 years ago. What is also quite interesting is that 
the USGS assessment predicted uh, most of, of the, uh, the hydrocarbon resources to be contained within a Jurassic play. Uh, resource assessment only uh, predicts that that less than 20% of, of the hydrocarbon resources is actually trapped within this Jurassic play here, whereas most of the resources uh, contained within uh, younger plays, that would be uh, Cretaceous and, and uh, Paleogene plays. Um, and going back to, to this previous slide here, of course, the, uh, the extreme burial depth of reservoirs that kind of emphasizes, you might say, a need to find uh, typically younger, more shallow reservoirs that would have preserved their reservoir potential better than, for instance, a Jurassic reservoir. It also emphasizes uh, a need, you might say, for a younger, more shallowly seeded source rock uh, than an Oxfordian Rhysanian source rock interval, for instance. To look into to that, uh, these, these needs, you might say, uh, we can look into what, what we have uh, been doing for, for the past 10 years of investigation, both in the onshore and in the offshore area. When it comes to the source rock interval, I can see later on uh, this afternoon there will be a, a presentation on, uh, on a Cretaceous uh, source rock study from the Norwegian margin. When it comes to, to the Greenland margin, uh, the jury is, is still out uh, when it comes to a Cretaceous source rock, but the nearest thing that we have to, to direct evidence for, for a Cretaceous source rock to be present is, uh, is coming from this, uh, this area here uh, on Hold with Hope, where we drilled a stratigraphic borehole uh, some years back. This stratigraphic borehole uh, was drilled into a Santonian to Senomanian succession. It uh, penetrated uh, as a sandy uh, unit which was completely stained with oil and this oil had a clear uh, Cretaceous biomarker signature. Um, beneath uh, this Cretaceous succession the Senomanian shales uh, had a, a gradually increase in TOC and HI values uh, downwards. Unfortunately uh, the source rock potential or source rock signature you might say of, of this shale unit uh, was destroyed by contact metamorphism along a sill that intruded this shaley unit. At, uh, and uh, when the, the, the uh, stratigraphic uh, well went into this uh, sill, the drill stem uh, broke and uh, we were not able to penetrate the sill and, and test uh, the source rock potential below the, the, the sill. So unfortunately, we, we still don't know the thickness uh, of, of this potential source rock uh, and, and the, the source rock signature as well as the uh, lateral distribution of it. So clearly further investigations are, are required. Unfortunately in, in Greenland the Sinomanian is, is uh, not that well exposed. It's only uh, exposed here and there. Uh, so it's not that straightforward to, to, uh, to investigate it, but it clearly, it's clearly needed. When it comes to uh, the reservoir rocks, uh, on the other hand, we have a much better understanding of, of uh, post-Jurassic reservoir rocks due to our work uh, done here for the past 10 years. And if we should uh, go through uh, the post-Jurassic reservoir potential of the area, uh, starting from, from the early Cretaceous, we can now see, uh, based on, on work in North Greenland, that during the early Cretaceous, uh, the North Greenland area was a, a, an area uh, with sedimentary bypass towards the southeast, towards the uh, northeast Greenland offshore margin here. We see uh, sandy deposits uh, deposited in, in North Greenland, but most of the sediments were presumably uh, bypassed to, to the offshore basins. And this also fits very with uh, seismic evidence that are documenting southwards progradation across this region here. Um, Slightly deeper into the stratigraphy, there might also be sources of sand uh, along these structural highs in the offshore area. Um, onshore, we have uh, analogs uh, to these these uh, to these local sand sources along structural highs from, uh, for instance, Wollaston Foreland, as these pictures are from, uh, where uh, we have uh, Vulcans, Valanginian, uh, coarse grained conglomeratic sandstones that are being shed along the flanks of structural highs and are kind of making up these uh, nice uh, coarse-grained lenses. 
we, we see similar coarse grain lenses based on seismic data in the offshore area that are uh, are likely analogs to, to these these offshore outcrops here. Unfortunately, uh, some of, of these uh, lenses are fairly deeply situated, so it's questionable if, if uh, they have, um, let's say, optimal reservoir potential still. Move up a bit in the stratigraphy to the mid-Cretaceous to, to Maastrichtian succession. There are also signs of uh, at least patchily developed uh, reservoir intervals, reservoir sandstones, both in, in northeast Greenland, but also in, in north Greenland. Um, and we also, based on seismic data, see intervals uh, locally developed, which which has nicely uh, nice seismic reflectivity, which could very well reflect uh, the presence of, of uh, sandy intervals. Moving further up, uh, we certainly see a change in depositional pattern uh, taking place from uh, around Maastrichtian time and into the Paleocene, where we see a lot of uh, progradation starting with the progradation taking place from, from uh, west towards east. Uh, this uh, progradation is also associated with a very nice reflectivity uh, in, in the units, and I would, would certainly interpret this sort of uh, sedimentary transport pattern to be associated with the bypass of, of sand to, towards the outer Norwegian margin uh, at the same time. We can also see that uh, one of the stratigraphic boreholes that was drilled on the, Norwe uh, the on the northeast Greenland shelf intersected a sandy uh, Paleocene uh, succession, which are documenting this this uh, this coarse grain input. There's also good evidence for a coarse grain uh, sedimentation both uh, from North Greenland up here, where more than 600 meters of Maastrichtian to Paleocene shallow marine sandstones are are present. Further south in, in the southern part of, of northeast Greenland, uh, this, this restriction to, to Paleocene succession is only uh, patchly preserved, probably due to, to uh, uplift around that time. But where it is preserved, it's uh, typically uh, highly, highly, uh, highly sandy. Okay, if we move further up in, in the stratigraphy into to the um, to the sorry, the lower and middle EU scene uh, here. Um, there's an, another intensification of this progradational pattern here, as you can see here. Um, this progradation is taking place towards uh, the northeast, and this sedimentary transport pattern is uh, consistent with the sedimentary transport uh, measurements done onshore. Uh, on lower EU scene uh, uh, deposits that are also documenting a north to uh, northeastward uh, fluvial uh, transport. And to understand why that is, we could zoom out a little bit from this map here and have a look on, on uh, the entire East Greenland margin. So this was uh, a time of, of uh, North Atlantic breakup and intense volcanism in the area marked by these reddish colors. This volcanism was, was mainly uh, subaerial in nature, um, and, and the, the basalts essentially made uh, a dam, you might say, uh, diverging the fluvial drainage pattern towards the north northeast, uh, heading into the Thetis Basin out here. Uh, this, of course, has some quite uh, considerable implications also to the Norwegian margin. I've heard that there's been speculations of sedimentary bypass from, from uh, East Greenland towards the Norwegian margin at that time, and certainly in this area, that does not seem to have been the case. Um, what is quite interesting uh, on this depositional pattern here, this these very nicely reflected uh, clinotheme uh, units, which almost has this forced regressive uh, pattern. This this pattern is uh, a one-to-one -one match uh, on what we find offshore uh, West Greenland. And in West Greenland, uh, the fluvial drainage was also diverted by, by basalts uh, into the offshore uh, basins. But in West Greenland, these, uh, these uh, uh, wedges has been drilled by exploration wells, and they have a very high net to gross of uh, roughly around uh, 70%. And uh, it's conceivable that the same uh, goes for, for the uh, Northeast Greenland counterpart. This progradational uh, progradation uh, continued into uh, middle EU scene time, 
despite the fact that that the uh, the volcanism and the basalt started to become transgressed. So still uh, the sediment transport was diverted towards the northeast here. So I think that there's good evidence for uh, post-Jurassic reservoir rocks uh, offshore northeast Greenland. Um, there may also be some indications of a Cretaceous source rock, but there still needs to be some, some investigations. But what about this, the structures? Well, I've made this collage of, of uh, seismic examples, uh, which clearly documents that structures uh, within the Cretaceous and the Paleogene section also occurs, including large structures. In these sections, the green colors mark uh, Cretaceous and the brownish colors marks Paleogene. Um, you can also see that some of the structures here are associated with, uh, with the DHIs, which is also uh, quite interesting, I think. So putting all of these uh, geological information into a resource assessment um, and, and doing the math, you might say, results uh, eventually in, in, uh, in the creation of, of uh, uh, maximum risk value stacks, which these five maps here represents. They are each representing a place, the Jurassic play in the lower right, lower Cretaceous play, upper Cretaceous play, restricted to Paleocene play, and a lower Eocene play. So if we look at the Jurassic play here, you can see that there are clearly a quite a dense distribution of, of large structures marked by these green polygons here. Um, but you can also see that there's a high risk indicated by these reddish colors. So the, the total uh, resource assessment, the risk resource assessment of the Jurassic play remains quite low. And there might be slightly fewer uh, structures within some of the younger plays, but the risks uh, is also lower. And consequently, the, uh, yes, uh, the resources, uh, the, the, um, the um, yeah, resource assessment reach fairly high, uh, have fairly high resources for these younger plays. What is quite interesting, if you look at, at the, uh, say, the Maastrichtian to Cenozoic place up here, is that the risks uh, on, the long, uh, on the inner margin is, is quite high uh, compared to on the outer margin. And that reflects uh, the uh, late, new, late uh, Cenozoic uplift of, of the northeast Greenland margin, which has, has strongly impacted uh, the preservation of hydrocarbons, but also in, in some places has completely removed uh, these these plays here. So the the play the let's say the the, the most prospective areas of of these uh, plays are typically situated on the central and outer part of of the shelf. And this is also uh, quite contrasting to to the previous assessment that predicted the the main exploration potential in within the the Denmark Sound Basin in here. <clears throat> so to summarize. Um, by integrating the most recent knowledge and data, uh, this results in a significant decrease in estimated resources offshore northeast Greenland. And uh, the, this, the resource assessment has been mostly impacted by the very thick lower Cretaceous succession and thereby the super deep burial of, of Jurassic and older source rock and reservoir rocks. Um, but by integrating uh, the onshore fieldwork data with offshore analysis, it suggests the presence of, of post-Jurassic place as the most important place uh, offshore northeast Greenland. So could there be uh, areas with larger overlooked resources? Uh, of course, yes. Uh, my best guess would be that the northern part of, of the northeast Greenland margin could be an area where, where the resource uh, resources might be slightly uh, overlooked. Um, this is uh, a result of, of uh, the lower data coverage across uh, this margin, and most of the data are actually quite poor in this, this region. But it appears that the Jurassic succession seems more shallowly situated up in the north compared to farther south. Um, but of course, the, the low data uh, coverage and the extreme ice conditions uh, uh, creates a lot of risk in this, this area here. Farther uh, offshore, I think uh, another interesting and, and uh, probably overlooked area would be part of the Fram Strait. 
uh, which I would like to show you a, a small example of uh, as the last part of, of this section here. I think it would be interesting to present this to, to my Nor Norwegian colleagues here. This is a seismic transect, a regional seismic transect. You can see this is 50 kilometers. The seismic transect crosses part of the Fram Strait up here along the, led, the red line. You can see on this map the dark gray colors outlines um, what is, has previously been interpreted as oceanic crust. And in this area here, be this area here, the oceanic crust has been interpreted to be primarily new gene in H. However, if we zoom in on, on part of the slide, we could zoom in uh, on this area here. We could also zoom in on some of the other parts here, but let, let's zoom in in this area, because in this area, the ODP well 909 was drilled uh, many years ago now. And this well intersected a new gene succession. It was flooring in, in uh, lower Miocene deposits. Subsequently, this seismic line has been acquired. And it's quite clear that, uh, that beneath uh, the, the TD of this well, there are some large fault blocks which are caught by uh, sedimentary strata. You can see the, this nice reflectivity um, here. The uh, fault blocks are capped by uh, a top oligocene on conformity, which we can correlate to another borehole uh, drilled on the uh, Hogar Ridge slightly to the south. Um, and what is interesting is that the ODP well 909 was abandoned prematurely because, uh, because it encountered thermogenic hydrocarbons. Uh, which is, is, of course, critical when you drill a well without a blowout preventer and so on. Um, but it's interesting because it documents a working petroleum system in this area here. And it's also interesting because these, uh, these um, rifted structures here, which must be pre, uh, oligocene or older in age, they document that this area up here is not oceanic. It must be uh, some sort of... of uh, a stretched sliver of, of Northeast Greenland continental crust. Um, so it actually documents an area of roughly around 20,000 square kilometers uh, with a working petroleum system and a very high concentration of large structures. And these structures are actually buried in a, in a depth which would be favorable, uh, I would presume, to, to preserve reservoir potential and, and, and so on. Um, the reason why I thought this was uh, interesting to show to, to uh, a Norwegian audience is that this area is actually part of, of the Norwegian uh, yeah, continental shelf area or, or yeah, part of Norway, <laughs> you might say. Uh, this blue line here outlines uh, the boundary of, of uh, Norway and, and Greenland, and you can see the area is, is located on the Norwegian side. The olive green line here, that is uh, outlining uh, the previously believed boundary of uh, the areas believed to, to hold a, a hydrocarbon potential. And clearly, that is not true. It should also include this area here. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, if you are interested in, in more knowledge or, or uh, knowing more about our resource assessment, uh, you are welcome to visit our uh, web page uh, here. Um, and, and all of, of uh, the resource assessment, including the interpretations behind the resource assessment, is freely available uh, here. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Very good presentation and uh, lots of uh, rounds of applause hands going up here on the team's message. So, yeah. <laughs> so we have quite a few questions come in and a few minutes left to, to get through them. So you maybe just touched on it there and the, on your last slide, actually. But Peter Borman asks, now that the new Greenland government wants to abolish all further petroleum related activities, will there be a push to make more acquired data public? <coughs> Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, as far as I know, most of, of uh, for instance, the seismic data uh, are actually in the public domain already. Um, I think the most recent data acquired, I, I can't recall if it's the last uh, since 2012, is probably still confidential, but I guess that, that they, they will also uh, be released 
uh, within a, f a few years. That's pretty standard procedure. Um, when it comes to to the work that that, for instance, the geological survey uh, has has been doing, uh, both onshore and offshore, we have an ambition, and are actually doing, uh, actually working to to publish uh, these things. That's that's uh, science that we would like to to have peer reviewed and then published, and that that also includes, for instance, uh, the resource assessment that we are doing. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. All right, so we've got some fairly long questions, so perhaps uh, <laughs> we, we could answer some of these in the chat after we finish, but I've got time for one more. So Ian asks, Ian Sharp asks, a very nice presentation uh, with the BCU at that depth in Denmark, Shavin Basin. Are you thinking that it's a lower Cretaceous hyperextended basin? Also with potential lower Cretaceous source rocks in there, I guess they're somewhat clastic diluted being so proximal hmm. to the clastic delivery in Greenland. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 difficult to imagine that at least the central part of the Denmark Sound Basin isn't a hyperextended basin. Uh, I have uh, a hard time coming up with a model that that could explain, you know, the development of say 16 kilometers of, of lower Cretaceous <laughs> deposit without having <laughs> extreme uh, uh, extension. And when when we look at when we map out the Moho, for instance, see that you 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 have areas which are hyperextended. Uh, unfortunately, in the, in the Denmark Sound Basin, uh, where you have a sedentary uh, section which is yeah, more than 20 kilometers thick, the moho is, is difficult to, to, to pick out precisely based on seismic data. But elsewhere, uh, we can see uh, clear uh, evidence for hyperextension. Yeah. So, yes, I believe so. <laughs> Good. Okay, well, I see we're, uh, we're at our scheduled coffee break. So, Perhaps, Michael, if you have some time, you could maybe respond to some of the questions in the chat. But uh, otherwise, I think we'll move to a coffee break and we'll return at 10.55 for the next presentation. But again, thank you. And uh, yeah, very nice work. Yeah, you're welcome. And you're also welcome to, to write me an email if you have further uh, questions. Yeah. Good. OK, well, we'll see everyone at 10.55 uh, then. Thank you. <laughs>